Hi, everybody. My name is Adam Pick. And if I have yet to meet you, I am the patient who started heartvalvesurgery.com all the way back in 2006. I'd like to extend a huge welcome to all the members who are coming on the line from places all over the world. And the mission of our website at heartvalvesurgery.com is simply to educate and empower patients just like you. And this webinar has been designed to support that mission. We've had over 750 registrations and we're really excited about this topic because as a patient, most of us are gonna go through some watchful waiting. Most of us are gonna to think to themselves, when is the right time? We're gonna work with our medical teams. And today we are very lucky that Dr. Hodges is gonna be with us to share some of these warning signs that surgery may be on your horizon. So, you know, during the webinar, you're going to be in what's known as listen only mode, but I encourage you to submit your questions throughout the webinar. And let's look at the uh, agenda real quick. We're going to go through the introductions. We're going to have some high level heart valve disease insights. We're then going to dive very deep into the five warning signs. We're going to have Q&A, and then we're going to get into a very quick five question survey as we wrap up the webinar. Now, when it comes to the introduction of our featured speaker, I am honored and I'm humbled that he is taking time away from his very busy practice at Northwestern Medicine in Chicago, Illinois. So who is he? Uh, Dr. Kevin Hodges is a cardiac surgeon and his specialties in particular are in minimally invasive heart valve surgery. Robotics is a core element of his practice, which has focus areas of aortic valve, mitral valve, tricuspid valve, aortic aneurysms, and atrial fibrillation. He's also an assistant professor of cardiac surgery at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern Medicine. Now, I could go on and on about the accolades and achievements of Dr. Hodges. It's been great getting to know him over the years. But what I'd like to do is simply show you this. This is a picture of the smiling faces of patients from the heartvalvesurgery.com community who have gone to Dr. Hodges and Northwestern Medicine and had very successful outcomes. You'll see here the smiling faces of Gene and Jim and Joe and Larry and Rob and just a whole lot of goodness has come from working with Northwestern over the years. And I'm excited to keep this ball rolling at this webinar by welcoming Dr. Kevin Hodges. Dr. Hodges, thanks for being with us today. Yeah, thank you so much, Adam. And I have to give you a shout out actually, because um, you know, Adam suggested this topic actually. And and it, in some ways it was a little bit tricky to put together, but it's a fantastic topic because it really echoes so many of the conversations that we have in the office every day. And people who are maybe nervous or apprehensive or really thinking about, you know, what a heart valve operation might mean. And so uh, let's uh, dive in and get started. So um, I just wanted to put this up because heart valve disease, and when we talk about people that might need heart valve surgery, it's really a huge spectrum. Um, a huge number of people at some time or another throughout their life are going to be told by a healthcare provider that they have a heart murmur. And, you know, very few of them will actually progress to have a severe valve disease or to need heart surgery. And so in some way, uh, that's meant to reassure people, but also to know that there are tons of providers who are specialists and experts in this area that can help you navigate these issues and know if or when a procedure is right for you. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and to illustrate that a little bit, I wanna show this, and you can just go ahead and play both um, videos here, Adam. These are two patients who have mitral valve regurgitation. On the left is a patient, I think I operated on this patient for coronary artery disease or something unrelated, who has mitral valve regurgitation that is mild, and it doesn't even need a repair at the time of another heart surgery. On the right is the complete opposite spectrum. Um, this is somebody who has severe mitral valve regurgitation, who is starting to experience symptoms of heart failure and who we needed to intervene and fix their mitral valve. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And Dr. Hodges, real quick, we have some patients on the line who may be newly diagnosed. We may have some patients on the line who have had multiple procedures. 
Yeah. Can you very quickly, the video on the right, it looks like a chaotic flow of red and blue versus something that's a little more orderly in the video on the right. Can you describe what's happening there with, I'm guessing that's the blood flow? Yeah, absolutely. So these are pictures from a transesophageal echocardiogram. They're done in the operating room in this case, but this is a procedure that's sometimes done in the office um, that shows blood, throw, blood flow through the heart. And um, what that bright color is, is actually the high velocity or fast moving blood that moves through the leaky valve. And so uh, what's opening and closing there is the mitral valve. And, and this patient, that's a little bit hard to see. This is just one representative picture. There's what we call mitral valve prolapse. And there's a severe prolapse where some of the cords that hold the mitral valve in place have actually broken. And the result is a lot of high velocity leaky blood flow going backwards into the left atrium of the heart. And, you know, even if you're not used to seeing echocardiograms, you can tell, as you said, there's a lot more bright colors, a lot more chaos there going on. It's a good way of putting it. Then in the picture on the left, where really there's hardly any leaky blood flow. And the point here is that lots of people look like that echo on the left and they're walking around and they'll never need any sort of intervention. But if it becomes the chaotic picture on the right, um, you know, we have a lot of tools to figure out what the right thing to do is. And, you know, this slide, you know, I, I don't mean to dive into this really at all, um, except for one point we'll make later, which is that we have a lot of guidelines that are driven by a lot of evidence and a lot of studies over time to know what is the right thing to do for specific valve problems. This is a huge range of things and the American College of Cardiology and American Heart Association have published these guidelines as well as sort of how strong really is the evidence to support them. A lot of experts have put countless hours into making these recommendations and they're there for us as providers, but also for patients to see sort of, you know, what are the scenarios where a, uh, a uh, valve intervention might be appropriate. Um, you can go to the next one. Um, for the purposes of this webinar, we're gonna use a lot of examples that have to do with two of the most common heart valve issues, which are aortic stenosis or a narrowed aortic valve or mitral valve regurgitation, which is a leaky mitral valve. And um, the purpose here is to highlight sort of big picture, sort of high level concepts of when a valve intervention might be needed. Um, but a lot of these things apply to other valves as well. I know we have a question coming up at the end about the tricuspid valve in particular, uh, which is a great question and we'll, we'll dive into that. Um, so we're gonna talk about high level things. And if you have a valve problem that isn't one of these two specific things, the concepts are still really applicable, but I wanted to sort of focus on two so that we could look at some of the data and some of the, the supporting echo pictures and things like that. Go to the next slide. So warning sign number one is when you start to develop symptoms. Um, and so the primary symptoms of valvular heart disease are the ones that I have in bold. Um, in layman's terms, shortness of breath, or the medical terms we use are dyspnea, or um, what this really is, the symptoms of heart failure, chest pain, or we use the term angina, or dizziness. And uh, we use the term syncope to describe specifically the type of dizziness where you get lightheaded and you're going to faint. You know, dizziness is a broad term. And uh, you know, some people get lightheaded or have vertigo or things like that. It's, it's broad, but specifically lightheadedness and this feeling of faintness uh, can often be a sign of severe valve disease. Um, but that's not the only thing. And, and we'll talk a little bit about how we tease these apart. But some patients present with fatigue or just not feeling themselves. Some patients have irregular heartbeats or feelings of palpitations. Or some people may have swelling in their legs from retained fluid, what we would call lower extremity edema. Um, if you go to the next one, um, we'll talk a little bit about why symptoms are so important. This is a, a graph, and bear with me in this, uh, some of these, these figures. We'll talk through them. I know they can be busy. Um, this is something that everybody's familiar with if they went to medical school, this specific graph. And what this shows is the, the natural history or the progression of aortic stenosis over time if it's not treated. And the pink line shows the percentage of patients who have uh, severe aortic stenosis who are alive without treatment. This was before we had valve replacement available for people. Um, and for the most part, people do very, very well. That line stays up near 100% for a very long time until people develop symptoms. And you can see that pink line sort of drops off of a cliff. And within a, really about three years, the chance of being alive with severe aortic stenosis and symptoms becomes very low. It's a very, very bad problem without treatment. And so you can see that if you start to fall into this category of developing symptoms specifically of chest pain, lightheadedness, or 
shortness of breath due to heart failure, your life expectancy without a valve intervention is very low. So this is a no brainer. If you have symptoms related to a severe aortic stenosis or really any severe valvular heart disease, it's time to do something about it. Um, if you go to the next slide. Um, and just, just real quick, Dr. Hodges, I yeah. want to make sure everybody in the line gets this because it looks like the window here for doing that intervention is very narrow. It looks like if you don't have any form of treatment done within something like 24 months, 50% of the people are, are not living. Is that accurate? That's true specifically for aortic stenosis. Some of the other valve uh, lesions, like mitral valve regurgitation, for instance, is a little bit better tolerated. But in particular for this one, yeah, once you start to develop symptoms of aortic stenosis, uh, there's really no time to wait. This is where you need to be thinking about having your valve fixed. This is about actually not just um, if you have symptoms, you um, do poorly without treatment, but once you develop symptoms, you actually do worse once you get your treatment. Um, so uh, what this shows, again, this is the same sort of line of how many patients are alive, but instead of looking at without treatment, this is starting from the day of your valve surgery. And this is for people with mitral valve regurgitation. Um, class one, two, three, and four are worsening class of symptoms. That's the New York Heart Association classification for uh, heart failure symptoms. Class one is essentially no symptoms and class four is very, very bad symptoms where you're essentially bed bound. And so this shows if you come in at one of these levels, how likely you are to be alive 20 years after your heart valve surgery. And you can see that there's a clear differentiation. So what this says is not only are you not likely to do well without surgery, if you uh, and have a valve problem like this, but also if you wait too long and you're in one of these more advanced classes of symptoms, you're less likely to make a full recovery and have that really good outcome that we shoot for after we fix your valve. You still have to have it fixed, but your long-term life expectancy and your long-term trajectory might not be as good if you prolong surgery too long after you start to develop symptoms. Um, so this leads us to the next question because most people, when they find out that they have a valve problem, and even probably for some time after that, aren't symptomatic. So what if you're asymptomatic? How do we decide? So that's where a multidisciplinary heart valve team comes into play. And this is really a hugely important uh, concept. So if you're a patient, you know, you're going to have your primary care doctor. You may have a cardiologist that you've seen regularly, and you're going to be monitored. You may have a new diagnosis, or maybe you are, are in surveillance and your heart valve disease is getting a little worse, that's the time to bring in a whole team of people, whether that's locally, whether it's uh, seeking a second opinion from a uh, comprehensive valve center, uh, but bringing in a team of uh, experts that includes perhaps other expert cardiologists who have expertise in specific valve diseases, dedicated cardiovascular uh, imaging specialists who are experts in echocardiograms and MRIs and all of these things, interventional cardiologists who may do procedures, you uh, have some questions about the TABR procedure, or you may have heard of mitral clips, some transcatheter options, or surgeons like myself, who are really going to be able to look at multiple imaging modalities, understand all the treatment options, and come up with really what's the right plan for each individual patient. Um, and this kind of falls into the, the, the realm of you know, sort of getting a second opinion about valve disease. And so if you go to the next slide, I want to talk about that concept for a minute. Um, you know, here at Northwestern, we're a, a referral center. Most of our patients um, come from outside of our system initially. And so we see people from all over the country, whether it's virtually uh, on the phone, in person, uh, this is a role that we fill a lot. And so uh, one question is, you know, what is the role? When is it right to get a second opinion about your valvular heart disease? You know, I think the times are when you have a new diagnosis and you're trying to understand what that diagnosis means. If there's been a change in your valve function, if you know, you've had mild mitral valve regurgitation for some time and suddenly you get an echo and it says it's severe and you're trying to figure out what to do. Um, certainly, if you have a change in your heart function, if you know your heart looks like it's becoming weaker, we'll talk a lot about this in a second. Uh, that's a really important time. If you start to develop symptoms or your symptoms are getting worse, or if anybody is recommending that you have surgery or an intervention, it's always a great time to get a second opinion. And, and when we talk about second opinions, if you go to the next slide, this is the key point. Um, yeah, getting a second opinion doesn't mean 
you're looking for a new doctor. It doesn't mean you don't like the opinion that you have. It means you're trying to get the, the most opinions that you can and the most up-to-date expert advice. And we tell our people, our patients who come to us to seek a second opinion all the time because we really believe that having more expert opinions leads to better decision-making and better outcomes. And so, you know, one of the roles that we sometimes fill here is to give a second opinion and give guidance, even when we know that a patient may not ultimately have all of their care at a center like Northwestern. But we do really think that's an important role that places like this fill is to make sure people have really the right uh, data and, and advice to go off of. Um, okay, so let's- Yeah, oh, and Dr. Hodges, real quick, as we talked about, we're all about empowerment here for yeah. patients. And this is really a, a critical moment, I think, because there is that thought that somebody a physician might take offense to getting a second opinion. And we have some recent data. We did a survey of 100 patients and we asked them the question, did you get a second opinion? 61% of those patients did go ahead and get a second opinion. So you are not alone. You're, you're not uh, abnormal if you decide, like Dr. Hodges is saying, to get a second opinion, because this is a big deal, right? <laughs> Dr. Hodges, heart surgery, it's Absolutely. different than a haircut. So I love what you're talking here about getting a second opinion and let's go on to the next slide. And so that leads us, um, so we're sort of out of the range of, you know, clear cut um, symptomatic valve disease because that's a no brainer. So the number two is you have a change in your heart function. And this is also kind of a no brainer. And we'll talk a little bit about what this means. So uh, let's go to the next slide. So even if you don't have symptoms, um, your heart can be feeling the effects of your valve disease. And the reason you don't have symptoms is that your heart is compensating. Adam, I have to say, these are homemade slides. I'm very proud of them. Um, <laughs> so here, we're going to advance through them here. You've seen them. All right, so go ahead. So if you have aortic stenosis, uh, your heart compensates just like any other muscle by bulking up. It gets really strong. So let's see what happens. There it is. So that's your heart as it's compensating for severe aortic stenosis. The muscle gets stronger, the muscle gets thicker. The opening of that aortic valve may be very small, even maybe the size of a, a pen, um, but the muscle gets strong and it's able to squeeze the blood through it and keep you from having symptoms, even though it's really working very hard. So let's see the mitral valve. And the same thing is through here. I, I don't have a great uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger analogy for this one, but your heart compensates when you have mitral valve regurgitation by pumping more blood with each beat. If a huge amount of that blood is going backwards, uh, the heart has to pump more with each beat uh, so that enough of it is still going forwards. And so this was my sort of analogy here, which is a, you know, a, a Lance Armstrong Tour de France uh, biker uh, who's sort of ultra efficient in terms of kind of moving things in the right direction. Um, so let's look a little bit in real life what that looks like. Um, so this is a patient who has severe aortic stenosis. Right in the middle, um, you know, for those of you who may have seen echoes or I don't know if Adam, if you can kind of hover right there, a little bit down there, a little bit down in that sort of bright white. Yeah, that's the aortic valve right there. It's thick, it's calcified, um, it's not opening and closing much. And the left ventricle is adapted to this. The muscle that's squeezing together has gotten very thick and the chamber inside the left ventricle is still relatively small. The heart's squeezing most of the blood out of that ventricle with every beat. This might even be somebody whose ejection fraction is higher than what we would normally see. It's a hyperdynamic left ventricle, very thick muscle. Um, so let's look at a comparison. We'll show a side by side in a minute, but let's look at what happens with a severe mitral valve regurgitation. So down at the bottom, opening and closing is a mitral valve right there. Thanks, Adam. Uh, this is a patient with mitral valve prolapse, those two leaflets don't meet at all. So they have, even though we don't have that color, you can tell they have severe mitral valve regurgitation. Well, this ventricle, um, the muscle thickness is normal, but the ventricular chamber is dilating. The heart is stretching out so that there's more volume in the heart with each beat so that as it squeezes, uh, enough of the blood is still going forward, even though a large proportion of it is going backwards into the lungs. So let's look at those two things side by side. I think you'll be able to see the difference. Um, yeah, perfect. So on the left, severe aortic stenosis with a small chamber of the ventricle. Yep, that's the valve right there, yep. And a thick muscle. On the right, you have the opposite. You have a big wide open ventricle that's very dilated to accommodate that leaky mitral valve. Uh, so let's go to the next one here and go back to my uh, cartoons. So the problem is that your heart can't compensate like this uh, forever. And so eventually with all of this work and compensation and, and, 
and straining, this is what happens next. Eventually you get failure. So um, you sort of run out of steam and then uh, what you can lead to is what you get in this next echo. So this unfortunately is a patient, um, actually a patient I operated on who has severe aortic stenosis that went untreated for a very long time. Um, you have the same sort of bright white calcified aortic valve in the middle. Um, exactly, yep. And the ventricle, it's no longer thick and squeezing heavily. It's actually sort of run out of steam. It started to dilate, which is bad in aortic stenosis. And you really don't see very much movement at all on the left side of that echocardiogram. This is a person whose ejection fraction was about 10%. They came in with bad heart failure and really made for a, you know, this, actually they did very well, but somebody who, who really was a tricky problem to solve. Um, and so this is what we don't want. And so going back to that heart valve team approach, um, exactly, yep. So um, this is where all of these experts come in. So if you have a severe valve lesion or, or severe valve disease and you're not in a immediate operative scenario, and we'll talk a little bit about who are the people we just operate on right away. It's really important that you maintain relationships with these individuals, follow up with regular echo follow-up to make sure that you when you start to see some of those early changes that we saw in those compensation echoes, that you start thinking about a valve intervention. You don't wanna wait until you become that last person because your heart, and again, another really insightful question coming up in the Q&A, once you get to that point, your heart is not likely to recover to normal. Um, and so even though we can fix the valve, you may never get back on that same trajectory that you started that you would like to get back onto. Um, so that leads us to number three. So these are patients who don't have clear-cut symptoms. You get an echocardiogram, their ventricular function is normal. They've got a severe valve problem, but they ask you questions like, am I slowing down? And this is something that comes up all the time. And so let's see, uh, these are some, some real comments that we get somewhat often. People say, well, I have severe aortic stenosis. I don't really think I have symptoms, but I definitely feel that I'm getting older. Maybe, you know, somebody says I, I'm 65. I don't feel the way that I did when I was 55, but I don't really think it's heart failure. Or, you know, I just noticed I take naps in the afternoon now, but I retired. And, you know, so now I don't have anything else to do. So I'm just taking a lot of naps. Um, or in a real patient of mine, a patient went to his primary care doctor because he ran a marathon, uh, but he didn't do as well as he did in his last marathon. And he said, there might be something wrong with me. And so, you know, these are really hard things to tease out. Um, you, you know, you ask a patient very straightforward, do you get short of breath when you exercise? Well, no, I don't. But I used to walk every day and now I don't. You know, so it's kind of hard. So how do we really sort these things out? So we have some tools. Um, so one of the, the very good tools that we have is something called an exercise stress echocardiogram. This is a test, many of you may have experienced this before, um, where you're asked to do exercise on a treadmill. There's a standardized protocol where you start slow and work your way up with increasing levels of strenuousness, essentially until you can't exercise anymore. And we call that your peak stress. Um, and once you reach that phase, you get an echocardiogram. And we're looking for specific things depending on what valve problem you have to understand whether either your valve is worse than we thought it was or maybe the valve is having a bigger impact on you than uh, anybody realized. And so let's look a little bit at at least our two, you know, sort of poster children. What are the things we're looking for? So um, let's take aortic stenosis as a first example. The first thing that we're looking for is, do you have what we call decreased exercise tolerance? So um, because it's a standardized exercise protocol, we know on average for people of certain age and gender, what would we expect somebody to be able to do on the treadmill? How far into that protocol can they get? Um, and sometimes we're surprised to see that a patient who is supposedly asymptomatic really has a significantly decreased exercise tolerance. And that's a big red flag. That's the patient that we talked about before who you know, maybe says, I, you know, I, I don't feel symptoms, but I no longer do any of the exercise I used to do. Um, it's a time to say, well, hey, maybe this is really the reason why you're not exercising. And it's a good red flag to objectively say, it's time to think about doing something for your valve. In aortic stenosis, one of the biggest red flags is a decrease in blood pressure with exercise. What happens, you know, you can imagine if your aortic valve is normally the size of a quarter and, you know, maybe it's the size of a dime because you have a severe stenosis, your heart's limited to how much blood it can squeeze out with each beat. Even, you know, if you're that Arnold Schwarzenegger heart we talked about before, even uh, with all the hypertrophy and strength in the world, it can only pump so much. So when you get on a treadmill, 
your muscles say we need more blood, those arteries dilate. So your heart's being asked to supply blood flow to a much larger uh, part of your body than it normally would. And it can't, it can't keep up. And so you actually get a decrease in blood pressure. And that's a big warning sign that that aortic stenosis is not only getting serious, but is actually dangerous without treatment. And so when we see that, that's a major indicator that it's time to, to move forward with a valve intervention. Um, with mitral valve regurgitation, again, we always look at exercise tolerance uh, relative to sort of peer groups to make sure that uh, we're not missing some symptoms that, you know, might have been overlooked. Um, but it's a little bit different what we're looking for in, in, in mitral regurgitation. One of the things we're looking for is to see if the valve function gets worse with exercise. So often we have a patient who may be on a resting echo, uh, has what looks like moderate mitral valve regurgitation. The valve's not normal, but it doesn't seem to be severe enough to maybe explain some low level symptoms. Well, when you exercise, the blood pressure inside of your ventricle goes up. And just like, you know, it's, it's fluid leaking through a hole, if you squeeze that fluid harder through the hole, it may leak more. And so somebody who says, well, boy, I get symptoms when I exercise, but my resting echo looks moderate. If they get on a, a, a treadmill, and during exercise, they have severe mitral regurgitation, then we have our answer. We say, you know what, your resting echo doesn't look so bad, but this is really impacting you when you try to exert yourself, it's time to do something. The next thing we look at is actually what the- Dr. Hodges, real, yeah. real quick, I, I, as a patient, I'm, I've got to be, I'm sure a lot of other patients are wondering this as well, which is what percent of your patients get stress echocardiograms before they have surgery, because I didn't have one. I was just told, hey, look, you got to get a surgery as soon as possible. Yeah, it's, you know, it's variable. I bet it's a quarter or maybe a little less. A lot of times between all these other things we're going to talk about this evening, we've got the answer that we need. A patient with symptoms, a patient with decreased left ventricular function, or what we'll talk about at the very end, a patient who's very low risk for surgery um, in terms of complications. Um, you don't really need this extra data to know that surgery is the right thing to do. But there's a lot of patients who fall, you know, I would say a substantial minority of patients who fall into this gray area where you're not sure what to do. And these are tests that help kind of figure that out. So certainly not everybody needs this. Um, but when you're a little uncertain what to do or, you know, one instance that comes up, you know, I like to think everybody wants to see me in the office, but I understand that maybe nobody's excited about the prospect of a heart operation. Um, Sometimes people come in and say, hey, I want to wait six months. Do you think that's safe? This is a great tool to say, well, let's put you on a treadmill. Let's see how you do. If everything looks fine, the chance of developing a complication over the next six months is pretty low. But if you get on a treadmill and things don't look good, then we need to have a more serious conversation about doing something sooner. So that's another good time to do a test like this. Great. Thanks so much. Um, so... The other one is a blood test, and I want to talk about this specifically in relation to aortic valve stenosis, and that's something called a serum BNP level. Um, so BNP is a hormone that is released by the left ventricle, and it, it's released when that heart muscle is stretched or experience increased stress. The main thing we use it for clinically is actually to track symptoms in heart failure patients. So a patient comes in the emergency room and they're short of breath, and we're trying to figure out, is this from the heart or some other organ? Uh, we can check this blood level, and it gives us some sense if the heart is being pushed beyond its limits. But what we're realizing is that, especially in patients with aortic stenosis who are asymptomatic, there's a subset of patients where this hormone is elevated, and it's a marker that the heart is working harder than it should be. Um, and so as we're deciding, is it time to do an early surgery for a patient with aortic stenosis? If that lab test is elevated, then those patients have a higher chance of progressing to that symptomatic phase in the very near future and have a higher rate of complications without having their valve treated. And so especially in that patient population, this is being uh, ordered and utilized regularly. So you may see this, you may be asked to have this blood test drawn to help determine, you know, are we at that stage or not? Um, so, so that's sort of the asymptomatic, we're not sure. This is a little bit of a different one, but something that's a little bit near and dear to my heart, which is um, the onset of new atrial fibrillation. So if you go to the next slide, atrial fibrillation is an abnormal heart rhythm. If you, I think if you turn on any 
you know, TV station right now, there's a lot of television ads that are about atrial fibrillation. It's getting a lot of press lately. Um, but what atrial fibrillation is, is essentially an abnormal heart rhythm where instead of electrical activity moving from the heart's internal pacemaker, you can call it called the sinoatrial node, through the upper chambers or the atrium of the heart to the ventricles in a coordinated manner, uh, the electrical activity in those upper chambers or atrium is what we call disorganized. It's sort of shown on the right here, these arrows moving all over the place. And what you get is a couple of things. You get first an abnormal EKG shown on the bottom. You may have symptoms of heart palpitations. Um, sometimes people get a very rapid heart rate. Um, and in some cases, they can even lead to heart failure or pretty significant symptoms. Um, but uh, if you go to the next slide, this is something that is very frequently associated with valvular heart disease. And the, the classic uh, example of this, the best one that's easiest to understand is with mitral valve regurgitation. The pictures on the bottom show two hearts. One is with the mitral valve on the left that works normally. There's sort of two leaflets that are pointing down attached to strings that you know are attached to the ventricles. Those leaflets are meeting in the middle. And uh, that's uh, if you show the left one, that's the normal. Yep. So, you know, they're meeting in the middle and there's no leakage. On the right, you see mitral valve prolapse and those two leaflets are billowing upwards into the atrium and blood is able to leak out in between them. That leaky blood stretches out the muscle in the left atrium. So anybody who's been followed for um, mitral regurgitation likely has seen some indication on an echo report that they have an enlarged left atrium. That's from the volume and pressure building up in the atrium and stretching that out. Well, that also leads to formation of fibrosis and scarring in the atrium that disrupts the normal electrical activity of the atrium and can lead to atrial fibrillation. So the first thing that atrial fibrillation tells us in a valve disease patient is that that valve disease is pretty significant. In order to get to that stage for the atrium to stretch out to develop atrial fibrillation, it needs to be a pretty significant uh, valve problem. So that tells us that it's severe and it's impacting the heart in a negative way. Um, so let's go to the next one here. The other important thing to know, you know, and this is, you know, very simply put is that atrial fibrillation is bad. Every study that's ever looked at populations of patients and compared patients with atrial fibrillation to patients without fib atrial fibrillation has found that even the life expectancy of patients with atrial fibrillation is reduced. Patients have more heart failure, more strokes. It's a really bad actor. And this, uh, we don't need to go into it, but this chart on the left side uh, this is a list of big population-based studies looking at um, people with heart disease, comparing patients with or without AFib. And the fact that all these black lines and diamonds and gray boxes and things are all clustered on the right side of that graph means that in every study, they found that atrial fibrillation is associated with worse long-term survival. Um, and that's a really big deal. On the right, um, we've got a, a, another important thing about atrial fibrillation, which is that atrial fibrillation is associated with blood clots in the heart and strokes. So because the blood isn't squeezed out of the atrium in a coordinated uh, fashion, that blood can uh, be stagnant, it can pool, especially in something called your left atrial appendage, it can form blood clots. And that's what's shown in this cartoon. Um, if that clot breaks loose, it can travel through the mitral valve into the left ventricle, out the aortic valve and into your bloodstream, go to your brain and cause a stroke. And that's why many people who have been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation are asked to take blood thinners potentially for the rest of your life. And so you've got something that is associated with bad outcomes, uh, potentially strokes and important lifestyle problems where people are required to take medications, including blood thinners. And so, so overall, this is a bad actor if this comes on in the setting of valve disease. Um, let's see what's next. So there's good news, and that is that atrial fibrillation is treatable. Now, treatment of AFib is an entire topic that we could probably spend an hour or more in a separate discussion on. But the important thing to know is that there's a surgical procedure called the maze procedure, which is actually the most effective type of ablation procedure we have in terms of eliminating atrial fibrillation. So a maze procedure has an 80 to 90% chance of curing AFib once and for all. Um, and it's very easy to add that to a valve operation. In fact, it doesn't significantly add to the risk of the operation. In fact, it uh, seems to potentially even make it a little bit safer. Um, and it can be done, you know, without really complicating, you know, what we're doing if we're gonna be operating for a valve anyway. The other thing that the maze procedure involves is closing off the left atrial appendage. The cartoon on the right um, 
has this sort of white angle thing as a, a representation of what we call a left atrial appendage clip. And what we do with that is place it in a way to keep blood from moving in and out of the left atrial appendage. That's the spot where blood clots form most commonly if you have AFib. If blood can't get in and out of that appendage, it can't form a clot there and it can't lead to a stroke. So it doesn't eliminate the risk of stroke, but it significantly reduces that risk. And there's more and more data coming out that just doing this improves people's outcomes when they have AFib. Um, so let's go to what's next. This one, I apologize for two graphs here, but I think it makes a really important point. So this is to show that treating AFib during your valve surgery improves your long-term outcomes. This is a really, really good study that came out of Un uh, Washington University in St. Louis all the way back in 2018, about five or six years ago now. On the left, we have these red and green lines. This is again, you know, starting all the way on the left, that's at the time of somebody's heart surgery. And going toward the right is over a course of time out to 10 years. And it's looking at the percentage of people who are still alive after their heart surgery. Now, by the way, I this reminds me of a question that we sometimes get in surgery, which is, if I have valve surgery, does that mean I only have a 50% chance of being alive at 10 years? No, it doesn't mean that. You have to remember that a lot of people who have valve surgery are having valve surgery later in life where their chance of being alive 10 years, maybe 50% anyway. So the, the sort of not having heart surgery lines look a lot like this. So I want to emphasize that. I've, I've been asked that question before, and I think it's a common uh, myth that if you have heart surgery, you're not going to live very long. That's not true. Um, but the point of these graphs is that patients who come into the hospital have valve surgery, who never had a history of AFib, have an expected postoperative trajectory. Patients who have heart surgery where they have AFib that was ignored actually live shorter. So they have much worse outcomes. So, so that shows us that, that AFib over time is really a detriment to patients. But if you look on the right, this shows that same green line is exactly the same. Patients who had heart surgery, who didn't have AFib, they do great. The good news is if you do a maze procedure, like we showed on the last slide, the new line, that's the blue line, people who have heart surgery who had a maze procedure, it's identical to the green line. Uh, that's identical from you know a statistical standpoint, even though they wiggle in and out of each other. Um, so treating your AFib, if you're a patient who has, let's say, mitral regurgitation, you develop AFib, it's a bad problem. But if you have your valve fixed, you have a maze operation, it puts you right back on that normal trajectory, the same as if you had never developed AFib in the first place. So again, a little bit busy, and I apologize for the statistics here, but um, I think it's a really important point that, you know, one, AFib means you have a severe valve problem. Two, if you have a severe valve problem and you have AFib, you need to get your valve fixed and you need to have your AFib treated because that combination of things is what's going to put you back on a, a normal trajectory. And there's a whole nother, you know, slide about under treatment of atrial fibrillation during heart surgery. So I would just put a little public service announcement. If you have a valve problem and you're talking to someone about that and you have AFib, please ask them what they're going to do for your AFib. That's a really, really important point. Yeah, Dr. Um, Hodges, this is something that we have been working on a lot. It's getting awareness up to these therapies, whether it's a maze procedure or a left atrial appendage closure to yeah. help patients. And I just want to make sure we have this question from Robin on this specific topic. I'm curious. She says, can you fix AFib at the same time as the valve if you are doing an open heart surgery? Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, if you go back, can you go back to the last slide? So these are, you know, surgical cartoons. Um, but if you look at the one on the left, that sort of beige thing down in there is the mitral valve. Adam, could you kind of hover over? Yeah, there you go. So that's the mitral valve. This is the exact exposure that I use during open heart surgery to repair somebody's mitral valve. And the white lines are meant to represent the lines of scar. Um, and I didn't go into a lot of detail about what the maze procedure is, but I, I can. Um, those are the lines of scar that we make in the muscle to try to cure the AFib. What the maze procedure is, it's actually named after like a maze in a children's coloring book. Um, it's a line of scars that go throughout the left atrium that disrupt all the known areas where atrial fibrillation comes from. But it also creates a path, a you know, so-called maze for the normal electrical activity of the heart to make its way from the atrium to the ventricle. So it preserves the normal electrical activity, but disrupts the abnormal. 
And as you see here, especially for mitral valve surgery, but for really for any surgery, it's very easy to add that because we're working in that area anyway. And so, you know, if you look at, I mean, there's tons of data on this. We could spend an hour easily. Um, if you look at surgeons and their approach to treating AFib, people that do a lot of mitral valve surgery, we're really good at this because we're used to working in that area of the heart. If you have a mitral valve repair and you have AFib, 90% of the time, anywhere in the country, somebody's going to address your AFib. I think the area where we're working on awareness is for other operations, for aortic valve surgery, for coronary bypass surgery, making sure that people are recognizing that this is a bad problem and you have a unique opportunity to address that at the time of heart surgery and really improve patients' long-term outcomes. Um, so that's AFib. So the last one, and this one actually we're going to probably spend the most time on because it's probably the most complicated, most data, is that if you are a patient who has a severe valve problem and you're low risk for complications during surgery. Um, and to understand this, I want to look at this graph again, a little bit homemade, so I apologize, um, which is the concept that timing of, of treating valve disease is a risk benefit calculation. So over time, if you... Ign uh, not ignore, but if you're, if you're in a watchful waiting period and you're treating valve disease with medicine, your chance of developing complications goes up. And those complications are things like atrial fibrillation, heart failure, or even death. So the longer you wait, the longer chance you have of developing that problem. And then the decision to proceed with surgery is a comparison, essentially, of the risk of an operation versus the risk of developing a serious complication by not having surgery. So if you go to the next one, this would be somebody who is high risk for surgical complications. And so the risk with surgery is way up at the top of the graph. These lines, they never cross because in this hypothetical patient, you know, let's say somebody's hundred years old and they have renal failure. There's no way that the risk of surgery is gonna be lower than the risk of continuing to treat with medicines. And it may be the case that we wait till the very end of this path, or maybe surgery never makes sense at all. Um, but now if you go to the next one, you know, you see somebody who is maybe a medium surgical risk, maybe they're have a couple compli or a couple comorbidities, maybe they're not so healthy, maybe they've had previous operations. This may be somebody that we know we're going to need to operate because we expect them to have a long life and, and we need to do something, but maybe we wait till they actually start to develop some of those symptoms. We want to know that they're actually going down that path before we subject them to an operation that may carry some real substantial risk. Then the last category is somebody who is low risk. And, and actually, I, I suspect that a large proportion of the people on this webinar probably fall into this category because for isolated valve surgery, most people are actually pretty low risk. These are people who we know that they have a severe valve problem. If it goes untreated, eventually they will develop problems, but they may be way in the future. But the risk of surgery is very low. For us, low risk is risk of complications, death, stroke, renal failure, serious things, less than 1%. If you are in that category, there's growing evidence that we'll go through in the next few slides that fixing your valve proactively actually improves your long-term outcomes because you never have a chance to develop any of those things. You know, so as much as, you know, we can treat AFib with a maze procedure or we can get you through an operation and, and you'll do well, it'll never be as good as if those things never occurred in the first place. And so for people who are low risk, where we think we can do a really good job surgically, the field is moving more and more toward a proactive early approach to valve surgery. And we'll go through that next. So this um, figure comes from the New England Journal of Medicine. It's from a, a trial uh, for patients with aortic valve stenosis. In this case, it was patients with what they call very severe aortic stenosis. So one of the ways these are measured is actually how fast the blood is flowing through the aortic valve, the, the velocity of blood flow. And you don't need to know these numbers, but to put it in perspective, the threshold for severe aortic stenosis is four meters per second. These are people with five meters per second. So they're even a little beyond the normal threshold for severe, but they were asymptomatic. And even if there was a question, they made them do a exercise stress echo to prove they were asymptomatic. So truly asymptomatic patients. And they randomly assigned them to either early surgery at the time of diagnosis or what they called conservative care. And that is waiting for a traditional indication, symptoms or declining left ventricular function. And then they followed them for, for four years and eight years. And they said, what is the chance of, of death either from surgery or from your valve disease? 
And if you look at these numbers, they're really, really striking. The early surgery group did way better. So at four years and eight years, the chance of death, you know, in some way related to that aortic valve disease was only 1%. And the people that were watched and waited, it was 6% at four years and 26% at eight years. So a really dramatic difference. And, and this has pushed us, I think, you know, pretty strongly toward offering early surgery to people. You know, so if you come to my clinic and you have aortic valve stenosis and it's significant, um, even if you don't have symptoms, if you're low risk for surgery, somebody, especially if it's a minimally invasive operation, um, you know, this is somebody that we're going to have a very serious conversation about having a valve replacement because we know that over the next, really not that long, they're going to have much better outcomes. Um, so let's look a little bit at mitral valve um, regurgitation and we'll dwell on that a little bit here. Um, this is a, a research project that was done here at Northwestern. It was um, headed by my, my friend and colleague, Dr. Patrick McCarthy, um, looking at the outcomes of mitral valve repair here at Northwestern. It was hundreds of patients. And what this study showed, um, we don't have to look at any graphs because they're really busy, um, is that long-term survival after mitral valve repair is actually worse if you wait for patients to develop symptoms or if they have a decreased ejection fraction or decreased heart function at the time of their operation. So we kind of touched on this before. Um, historically, the recommendation was to wait for one of these two things before doing mitral valve surgery. What we've learned over the last several years is that actually people do better in the long term if we're more proactive. So if you're asymptomatic, we don't have these things, and you're a reasonable surgical risk, it makes sense to get your valve fixed. And the other thing that this study showed, I'll show you a figure in a little bit, is that the risk of these operations is extremely low and that the chance of having a good durable repair is excellent. So um, if you go to the next slide, I, I said I wasn't going to show all the guidelines, and I just want to show this one. Um, this is in the latest iteration of the American Heart Association uh, valve guidelines, and it just shows that this has finally made it to the point where there's a consensus on early intervention for mitral valve repair. Um, and what it says is in asymptomatic patients with severe primary mitral regurgitation, that primary mitral regurgitation means mitral valve prolapse, and normal left ventricular function, Mitral valve repair is reasonable when the likelihood of a successful and durable repair without residual regurgitation is greater than 95% with an expected mortality rate of less than 1%. So that's that low risk we talked about when it can be performed at a primary or comprehensive valve center. Um, so there's a lot to unpack here, but the key point is asymptomatic patient with a normal heart function who's low risk for surgery where you can get a good durable repair and make sense to operate early rather than wait for some of those traditional things. Um, and so let's talk about what goes into some of these um, these criteria. So let's go to the next one here. Yeah, and Dr. Hodges, I don't think you can see me, but my eyebrows are going to the top of my head. Uh, this is all really new data that I was not aware of in terms of a very proactive stance, given the risks of waiting too long to have a, a procedure done. We have just about 10 minutes left. I just want to let you know, we still have some questions to get to in a rapid fire Q&A. Oh, so yeah. If you could move through these uh, as, we'll, as fast as possible, that'd be great. Yeah, we'll move through quick. The point of this slide is to say that if you have mitral valve prolapse, you really want to repair, not a replacement. Replacement's great for certain people. Repair means great durability, hopefully one operation in your lifetime, no blood thinners, and lower risk of infection. Let's go to the next one here. We'll skip the surgical video. That was like, you know, four minutes. Um, this slide is to point out that mitral valve surgery ought to be performed at a center that does a lot of it. Um, there's a ton of data to show that most centers in the United States are doing fewer than 100 mitral valve repair operations a year. If you do less than 100 to 200 cases a year, your chance of having a high operative mortality rate and a low valve repair rate are, are much higher. And there's a big step off. If you look at the graphs on the right, you can see that this slope of these lines, that's kind of what we're looking at, really changes dramatically in between 100 to 200 cases annually. And so um, it makes sense. Experience is the biggest thing that guides good outcomes in mitral valve surgery. This one is to highlight our outcomes because I'm really proud of them. Um, it's from that same paper, but it shows what a mitral valve center of excellence really looks like. And these are people who are asymptomatic. These are the early surgery patients who had mitral valve repair at Northwestern. Um, the operative mortality rate, 0%. The 
Chance of needing a reoperation for your mitral valve within 10 years, 0%. And the chance of having worse than moderate mitral regurgitation sometime within that 10 years is only 0.6%. So, you know, I'm super proud of what we do at Northwestern. I'd be lying if I said we're the only center with these outcomes. I think we're really, really good. But it, the point is that a mitral valve center of excellence, a high volume center is where you want to have your mitral valve surgery. Um, the other really important thing to touch on is that if you come early for surgery and you don't have these other problems, you haven't developed AFib, you're not in heart failure, your ventricle is working well, you have a much higher chance of having a minimally invasive operation. Um, so we can do operations for valve disease that doesn't go through the breastbone, that goes between ribs, or is a robotic operation where the recovery time is closer to two weeks instead of the normal six weeks that we quote for a traditional heart surgery. But as we talked before, or we got going in earnest, we only do that if we can't, don't compromise on safety. And the more other things that come up, the more patients present with heart failure, the more they have concomitant problems, the less likely we can really do this safely. And so early surgery gives you a better chance of a minimally invasive operation and a short recovery. And we'll skip through this video. We'll skip right? the video. Okay. <laughs> um, and so I just wanted to highlight that. I mean, this is exactly what I said. This is what we tell people for a robotic mitral valve repair or a mini thoracotomy aortic valve surgery. They should expect three to four days in the hospital. Don't lift anything heavier than 20 pounds for two weeks. Don't drive a car while you're taking narcotics. That's important. Um, but otherwise, you can go back to your normal life in two weeks. Now, you'll be sore. All right. I don't want to oversell it. It'll be a little sore, but you know you can get on the golf course, you can exercise, you can lift weights, you can do work around the house, you can go back to work. Um, and so that's a big deal um, compared to what people are used to thinking about with heart surgery. So um, this um, is just a, this is from us. This is a um, something that we're really, uh, you know, excited about, which is a, a fast access uh, program for Northwestern that if people have questions, we know people have questions if they want a second opinion or even just to see what we're about. Um, this gets you in contact with a dedicated nurse within 24 to 48 hours of, of reaching out. And usually you can talk to myself, one of my colleagues in surgery or whoever the right person is. We try to make an appointment available within the first one to two weeks of reaching out to us. We realize that it's sometimes hard to get appointments places and, and we wanna do what we can to be available for patients. All right, let's go to the questions. Yeah, Dr. Hodges, I can't thank you enough for the prepared remarks. A uh, lot of learning. And to answer Michael's question to get this going, will the slides be provided after the web uh, webinar? The answer to that is yes. You're going to get access to not only a, a webinar replay of the video, but you're also going to get an ebook with a tr full transcript of all the great information that Dr. Hodges has shared today. So now, Dr. Hodges, we're going to rapid fire Q&A with you. Let's get started. My question to get this going, many patients in our community have already had a primary procedure. We got folks who are newly diagnosed, but a lot of folks are in that watchful rating in the reoperative stave, stage. Are there different signs for patients who already had a valve replacement or a valve repair that is now failing? And Roberto asks, what about paravalvular leak? Yeah, great question. So um, the signs aren't really different, but the, it does point a little bit to the risk benefit uh, issue that we talked about before. In certain cases, a reoperation is riskier than a primary operation. Sometimes it's not, but it can be. And so um, we have to kind of weigh those things. And often we're more inclined to wait a little bit if we're going to reoperate and do open heart surgery again for valve than a really early proactive operation, but that's not always the case and, and every patient is a little different. The other thing that paravalvular leak hits at is there are often transcatheter options that are better suited to patients who have already had an operation than patients the first time. So a lot of times paravalvular leaks can be fixed um, uh, transcatheter therapy, or you can have what's called a valve in valve operation where a valve can be re replaced a second time inside of a surgical heart valve. There's a lot of growing experience with that, and it's often a very good option. Fantastic. Hope that helped you, Roberto. I know it helped me. Uh, Richard asks, I was recently diagnosed with moderate mitral regurgitation. Can I still exercise, run, pickleball, yoga while I'm in the waiting room? Absolutely, and I would encourage it. Um, you know, but like anything, pay attention to how you feel. Um, if you feel like your exercise tolerance is decreasing or you get short of breath, talk to your cardiologist and get an echo to see if something's changed. But I absolutely would encourage being as active as you can be. Right. Moving over to Susan, she asked, what percentage of people with heart valve disease develop congestive heart failure? 
this is the hardest one because we don't really know. Um, we don't know what number of people are walking around with undiagnosed mild to moderate bowel disease. Um, and so we don't know, you know, in a math perspective, the denominator. Um, but to put it in some perspective, um, something like two to 3% of the population has mitral valve prolapse. Um, and so when you think about that, I mean, that's a huge number of people, very few of them will go on to develop congestive heart failure. And ideally we treat them all before they get to that point. So maybe none, but, um, but it's actually a very small percentage of people who maybe have mild valve disease on an echocardiogram will ever go on to develop heart failure. Great. Thanks. This is a very interesting question from Jane who asks, what can you tell us about the EVOID clinical trial for aortic stenosis? Is it possible that evocliptin can help with calcium aortic stenosis prior to surgery? Yeah. Evocliptin is a diabetes uh, medication. It's being studied in a, in a big trial to see if it reduces the progression of aortic stenosis, if it reduces how much calcium builds up in your valve over time. So they're looking at people with not severe, but mild to moderate aortic stenosis and seeing if it makes a difference. There's been a lot of trials like this over the years with different agents, different approaches to see what might work. I don't know. I, I, to be honest, I don't know where things stand from a data collection standpoint in that particular trial. Um, I do know that so far we haven't found a really good holy grail for preventing the progression of valve disease. Even as a surgeon, I can acknowledge that if we could halt the progression of these things and prevent people from needing surgery, that would be the best case. Gotcha. And then Evan asks, how would a patient know if the echo being done uses the latest technology? How do I know if the technician is good? Does that matter? Yeah, this is a good question. So um, good technicians, good cardiologists that are used to reading echocardiograms, that's all very important. Um, the American Society of Echocardiographers has some resources about um, echo lab accreditation, and that's one resource. But I think just like um, with valve surgery, you want to be at a center that does a lot of valve echoes. So, you, and you want a cardiologist that has seen a lot of valve echoes to really know the subtleties of these things. Got it. And this is a question we referenced earlier. John asks, hi, Adam, can a valve sparing aortic root aneurysm repair and aortic valve repair be done through a mini thoracotomy? Yeah, people talk about it. I've seen videos of it. Um, I think they're probably highly selected patients. Our approach would not be to do this operation through a mini thoracotomy. Um, personally, um, you know, again, and I only speak for myself and, and our practice here, I think that we would be compromising on some of the safety to do such a big, it's a, it's a big operation. It's a fun operation. I like to do it and we have great results. Um, but I don't think I'd be being honest if I said I could do it through a mini thoracotomy with the same safety and outcomes as I could through a full sternotomy or a, even a partial sternotomy. Well, and again, I love your approach to safety, right? You're not compromising yeah. anything, a technique or an approach. And I've heard you say it over it. Safety is paramount to everything that you do. Mayrab has a fascinating question, a set of questions about remodeling. I'm going to summarize it is if essentially you have mitral valve disease and you have some issues with left ventricular ejection fractions, can the, can the heart remodel over time after surgery to restore kind of normal cardiac function? Yeah, it's, it, it's actually a complicated question. Um, it depends a little bit on what the etiology of everything is. Um, I'm going to make an assumption here for the purpose of giving a concise answer. Um, and I'm going to assume this is like mitral valve prolapse and that the ventricle is dilated as a result of the valve disease. Once the ejection fraction starts to decrease, you often never get back to a totally normal ventricle or normal ejection fraction. But I think it's worth pointing out that that ejection fraction number doesn't exactly equal heart function. It's an estimate. It's based off a 2D echo picture. So if your ejection fraction is 45 to 50%, I fix your mitral valve and it drops to 30 to 35%, you're still going to feel way better at that level because at that 45%, half of that blood is going backwards. So effectively, your, you know, your effective ejection fraction is really much lower. Got it. Gladys has a great question. Hey, I'm in the waiting room. Are patients with heart valve disease at more risk of getting an infection? Yeah, um, certain things like mitral valve prolapse, bicuspid aortic valve disease have been shown to be associated with um, increased risk for uh, endocarditis, but that risk is probably relatively low. Um, if you take as evidence, 
um, the American Heart Association guidelines for taking antibiotics during a dental procedure, they've actually stopped recommending that for people with those sorts of things. It's really for people with artificial valves or previously repaired valves, things like that. So the, there is an increased risk, but it's not something that you have to sort of like live your life in fear and you don't necessarily need to take extra precautions. Right. And I'm going to jump forward to this question from Kim because I get it all the time. Kim asks, I now have moderate aortic stenosis. Is TAVR suitable for someone who with a bicuspid aortic valve who is below 60 years old? Like most people, I'm a bit apprehensive about getting the open heart surgery. My goal is to try and advance to my late 50s before surgery needs to be performed. Yeah. TAVR is a fantastic technology. We said at the beginning, um, and it's, and it's probably very good for low surgical risk people. I think it's good for really a lot of people, especially people with normal aortic valve anatomy. And the categories of people where maybe surgery um, is still the right way to go, unfortunately, is probably Kim, um, where bicuspid aortic valve, the seal with the currently available uh, technology is not quite as good. Um, so people with bicuspid aortic valve who are younger, potentially going to need multiple operations um, in the future. There's also some concern about if you can get in quite as big of a valve size. These patients probably are still better suited with a surgical aortic valve replacement. But the good thing, um, Kim, as a, a healthy 50-something-year-old who has a bicuspid aortic valve, is almost certainly going to be a pretty good candidate for a minimally invasive operation. And so, so that's somebody that, although they're not excited about heart surgery, um, it may be coming down the road and probably somebody we can do a very good operation for. Wow. Well, thank you, man. On that note, wow, we still have over 200 people on the line. We are now over time. And before you go ahead and exit the webinar, please hold on. On behalf of myself and the team at heartvalvesurgery.com, Dr. Hodges, we want to extend a humongous thank you to you. We have learned a lot today and we can't thank you enough for taking time away from your very busy practice at Northwestern to help us learn about the five warning signs. So thank you, Dr. Hodges. Absolutely. Adam, thank you so much. And and I think this is going to happen anyway, but I just wanted to say to the people on the line that if there's questions, I know we didn't get to some of the questions and there may be some in the chat. Um, please get my contact information out there and, and we will try to get to all those questions so people get them answered. Great. And I also want to thank everybody who is here as a community. We are together live doing something that only happens a few times a year in an effort to educate and get the empowerment we need to get the best care for our hearts. And the last thing I'm gonna do is thank you for completing the survey that is gonna be coming up on our screen. Again, thanks everybody so much for being part of the webinar today. And Hi everybody, it's Adam. I hope you enjoyed that video. And don't forget, you can always subscribe to our YouTube channel. Watch the next two educational videos coming up on your screen or click the blue button to visit heartvalvesurgery.com.